Welcome back to DOT University. I'm Ryan, the DOT guy. Today we're bringing you a video on how to determine what a commercial motor vehicle is. Probably one of the most misunderstood single questions within fleets across the nation. For years, I've been doing training on this old flow chart. We're out with the old, I'm remastering it, bringing it to you in this video. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you hit that subscribe button right down there below us so that we can proceed on with this video. Oh, and while you're down there, hit that bell so you can be notified when we come out with new videos so that you can stay off the radar. Let's go ahead and get into this. What we're doing is we're identifying commercial motor vehicles for interstate commerce. This is a 10 minute topic and this video is packed with so much information that it takes every bit, maybe a little bit more than 10 minutes. I cut away a lot of the information I like. If you've been through a lot of my videos, you'll know that I like to go into details to really help you understand the topic. Well, this topic is big enough that I've got to talk right through it to get all the way through it. So I'm not going to worry about if I go over just a little bit on 10 minutes, I don't want to sacrifice knowledge for trying to race the clock on this one. So first of all, when you go through and hear the term commercial motor vehicle, what is it that you think of or the word CMV? Okay. Most people hear that big truck, the 18 wheeler, the semi, maybe a tandem axle dump truck, something like that. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in somebody's office talking to them about their fleet and everything they're talking to me about is CDL type vehicles. And as I'm looking out their window or see some of their crews drive by, I see other vehicles, things that are so often forgotten about. And that's this, this slide. Every vehicle on here is a commercial motor vehicle. Okay, and you'll see that as we go through and we see the rest of the definition and how these play out. Now, each one of these vehicles tell a story. Some of them I will have some side videos on to kind of help make this just a little bit more clear for you. Now, the term commercial motor vehicle is defined in the Code of Federal Regulations, the DOT rules in 390.5T. And that means any self-propelled or towed vehicle used on a highway in interstate commerce to either transport passengers or property, okay? Now, the first point, the one that everybody's got to remember for sure is going to be it has either a gross vehicle weight rating or combination weight rating. And I'll get into that point here in just a moment. Or gross vehicle weight or combination weight of 10,001 pounds or more, whichever is greater. Point number two, is it is designed or used to transport more than eight passengers, including the driver, for compensation? Point number three is going to be it's designed or used to transport more than 15 passengers, including the driver, but not necessarily for compensation. And lastly, it's used to carry some type of a, a quantity of hazardous materials that requires placarding. Okay, now that's a lot of information here within this, this excerpt from the DOT rules. Um, I'm going to try to break it down, get it just a little bit easier to understand for you. So first thing that we've got to talk about is interstate commerce. Okay, I'm going to have an entire another video on interstate versus intrastate commerce just to help clarify that. There are many people throughout the nation that are very confused on that topic, and it can get pretty confusing. Something that you would think is easy can be. For instance, both of those trucks that we see up there, the UPS and the FedEx, both of those drivers are interstate, okay? And that's because of the packages they're carrying with them. Even though they're just driving around in your neighborhood, they are still interstate vehicles. Okay, gross vehicle weight ratings. Gross vehicle weight rating is the value that's specified by the, by the manufacturer of the loaded weight of the single vehicle. So it's found on the VIN label. So if you go inside your door, usually on the driver's side, you'll locate that VIN label. You're gonna see some GVWRs, maybe a GAWR. You might even see a GCWR, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you're gonna look at that weight rating, identify the poundage, and on this image, we have 9,900 pounds. In the trailer, in this particular trailer, we'll see that we have a gross vehicle weight rating of 16,000 pounds, okay? So the gross combination weight readings are two points that can be made there. It can be the value that's specified by the manufacturer of the power unit, such and it can be displayed on the VIN label, or it can be the sum of both of the gross vehicle weight ratings or gross vehicle weights added together. So in this combination, we have 16,000 with 9,900 pounds 
add those together, we are over the 10,000 pounds. On that combination weight rating marking on your power unit, some units can have that marking on the power unit. For instance, on this particular GM truck, you can see that it has a gross combination weight rating marking of 15,000 pounds. Now I do want to point out the exception. If you have a GCWR marking on your VIN label, if you're not pulling a trailer, that is not used to define if you're a commercial motor vehicle, only the gross vehicle weight rating at that particular point. In the second example that we have, you have a vehicle uh, that has a gross combination weight rating of 27,500 pounds. Okay. Now combination weight, actual, the actual gross vehicle weight and combination weight, this is, can only be determined by actually weighing those vehicles. It's the laden weight, could be the empty weight. It's just whatever the vehicle weighs. This is important because you might get yourself a vehicle that you think is under 10,000 pounds, but actually goes over 10,000 pounds because you load it heavier. A combination weight would be the combination of the truck and the trailer. All right, so that's a lot of information. Let's try to break down that definition. So here at Front Range Compliance Services, I like to make uh, flow charts to make sure we get out to our clients to help them clarify it. If you've been to any of my live training events, I've given you flow charts like this one. Well, this is the newly redesigned, you know, what is a commercial motor vehicle, you know, flow chart. And this one though, to break it down just a little bit more, we're gonna go by the, uh, the discussion points at the top. Okay, number one, is the vehicle being used in commerce to transport passengers or property? All right, if you answer no to that, it's really simple. No DOT compliance is required. So that could come to your hobbyists, maybe your racers, your rodeoers, personal usage or recreational vehicle. Now there's always a maybe because there are some caveats that go with that that could indicate that you are a business, okay? Um, now, let's say you answer yes to that. Is the vehicle being used in commerce to transport either passengers or property? The next question says is, does the power unit have a gross vehicle weight or gross vehicle weight rating of 10,001 pounds or more? So that could be basically your one ton trucks and bigger. So your F-350s or 3500s and up from there. And you can see down there, I've got several different examples from the newer 5500 series to your Isuzu. Heck, we even got that old school bus on there that somebody converted to a passenger vehicle slash property carrying vehicle for a business. Okay, let's say you answer no to that. You're, you're Maybe you're pulling that Ford F-150. It's not over the 10,001 pounds, but you have a trailer now, okay? Does the combined units have a combined weight rating or a combined weight of 10,001 pounds or more? Okay, so you can see this picture down here, this black Ford. Okay, he's pulling that trailer. All right, so he's probably got a 7,000 to 7,500 gross vehicle weight rating on that pickup. He's pulling this trailer, which is right around a 10,000 pound trailer by itself. Okay, so those two together, all right, we're up to, you know, at least 17,000 pounds. Okay, other examples that you could see up here are going to be like the landscapers. These guys are a dime a dozen. You see them, sometimes you see a Toyota Tacoma pulling that type of trailer. If the two combinations go over 10,000 pounds, then it becomes a commercial motor vehicle. Now there's no cap on this, on the weight. It goes up and up and up all the way to the big rigs. All right, if you answer no to that one, okay, meaning you've got usually like a smaller vehicle than the vehicle by itself, the question goes to, are you carrying a placardable amount of hazardous material? Okay, now these vehicles, such as this white uh, old Dodge that we have here, he's got some explosives, or you've got that white uh, van, that panel van, and he's got oxygen in there, or I don't know what you got going on with that red truck, but that's a whole topic on itself. Now, the one thing I do want to point out is that these vehicles are also subject in this one, in the hazardous material, are subject to the commercial driver's license standards and also the hazardous material rules and regulations, okay? Now, if you answer no to that one, and that takes us here to an almost the last question, it says, is the vehicle designed or used to transport more than eight passengers, okay, including the driver, for compensation? So you gotta think about that, that's nine or more, okay? 
And that's this is for business, right? You got your limos, you got your rafting services, you got your vans, airport shuttles, and your passenger coaches. Those are all directly paid for hire uh, for compensation passenger carriers. The answer no to that. Say we just got a bus, we're using it for our business, or we're a hotel shuttle. Okay, is the vehicle designed or used to transport more than 15 passengers, including the driver, not for compensation? Okay, absolutely. So we have the school bus, the special event, special activity, a school bus there. Okay, it's not the normal 70 passenger bus, but it is, okay, more than 15. You have your hotel shuttles. Okay, over here, we also have, this is a Union Pacific bus. It's used for transporting workers out to the railroad where they're going to be working on it. Now, I do want to point out with this one, okay, the term designed to transport is defined in the CDL rules and regulations under 383.5 interpretation question number one. And basically what that says is, does the term designed to transport mean the original design or if somebody can remove some of the seats, does that make take it out of a passenger carrier vehicle? Okay. And the term designed to transport does mean this original design. If I go through and pull out all those back passenger seats, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the original design. So it would still be designed to transport more than 15, even if there's not 15 seats in there, if that was the original design. Now, if I take out all of the seats except for the driver's seat, then yes, I can convert it into a property carrying vehicle. Okay. So you make it all the way down through that chart. Okay. And basically that's going to tell us, hey, if you answered no to everything, then no DOT compliance is required. So just a special note though, you want to make sure that you check with your state and your local jurisdictions, check their rules. You want to make sure they don't have any specific requirements, you know, such as California over there on the West Coast, they tend to have a lot of their own rules for vehicles being used in business. All right. So right here alone, make sure you, you know, again, this was a helpful video to help you. If you got something out of this, that you can benefit you and your fleet, you know, make sure you give us a like on that video. Now, when we go back and we sum up this entire topic, we we'll want to make sure, okay, to use this chart. If you land over there into the DOT compliance required, it's super important to know. First off, you've got a major victory. You've identified your fleet. So now, okay, the hard work begins because this is where the rubber meets the road. All right. The DOT compliance, you have CDL compliance, but you also have non-CDL compliance, okay? You know, your non-CDL operations goes all the way down through the different parts, part 387 through 396 and Appendix G, super important stuff. Now, if you have CDL operations, okay, and you'll know that, check out my identifying what is a commercial motor vehicle or the commercial motor vehicle classes, okay? Those rules that are applied into non-CDL, they also apply to CDL, but there's a few more that you have to tack on, okay? And then you need to also pay attention to your state-specific requirements. Those are each going to apply uh, across the board a little bit differently. Here in Colorado, um, we have some changes to the rules, which I'll address in the the state-to-state -state videos, okay? All right, with that, that is the uh, brass tacks of what is a commercial motor vehicle. I appreciate y'all hanging in with me to the end. Make sure you give us a subscribe and hopefully we'll catch you on one of these next videos. Comment below if you have any questions.